So good morning, everybody. Welcome to the third Primer Seminar. Um, I'm Frank Noé. Uh, I'm a professor here at uh, Mathematics and Computer Science and uh, leader of the Computational Molecular Biology Group that is uh, the main developer of uh, the Primer software. And uh, these uh, five days, or three plus two days, depending on how long you stay, uh, will be on uh, some theory of uh, Markov modeling. So the approximation of stochastic processes and especially molecular dynamics with uh, uh, Markov chains and their analysis. And, and how to do that with the program package Python. So I will now give you a one hour overview, very broad. <coughs> um, and then uh, the speakers and presenters after me will go into, this, into the details of some of these topics and go through some notebooks with you and then you will be working on notebooks yourself. So I'll just start uh, with a general introduction and before I just wanted to put up the installation instructions again. Um, s many of you probably already have Pyama installed, maybe some of you are still in the process and there will be um, a little <coughs> session after my talk on, on, on this, but um, just <coughs> to save some time, those who haven't installed it yet can try this. So basically, uh, if you install it for the first time, you do this, um, assuming that, you're, that you're having Conda on your computer, which is the easiest solution. You can also install Pyama with PIP, but with Conda it works like this. So you add this channel, <coughs> Omnia. Um, so channels are like, uh, yeah, are, are ways to, to, to patch uh, uh, software that uh, is not a part of the, um, the main uh, a distrib main height distribution. Everybody can open a channel and uh, deploy a package there. And Omnia has a bunch of uh, softwares for molecular dynamics, um, MD analysis, etc. Uh, that will change at some point in the future. We will move to another channel called Conda Forge. But for now, we have both in parallel and this should work. Then you can install Pyama with this command and you can use the same command to upgrade it. If you have an older version, you can just run this command again and upgrade to 232, which is the latest version. And then you can um, just open a Python uh, a command or a, a Jupyter notebook to import Pyama and check the version and see if that worked. But more of that stuff later. <coughs> So, um, okay, let's uh, get to an overview. So this is a cell, and uh, in cells we have um, a lot of biomolecules, for example proteins and other biomolecules that interact with one another, and these interactions and the state changes of these uh, biomolecules <coughs> give rise to a functional network uh, that drives the biomolecular processes in the cell, the biochemical processes, and the overall behavior of the cell. And um, since biology is inherently multiscalar, so a single point mutant, a single chemical modification at one protein can affect the entire behavior of the cell, of even the <coughs> organism at the highest level, everything is coupled down to the atomistic scale. So in order to really understand uh, uh, this multiscalar nature of biology, in order to get faithful models of biology and eventually be able to um, um, influence them, develop drugs or <coughs> biotechnological processes, etc. It's important to have all of these scales somehow in the model. Of course, you cannot simulate everything atomistically. You cannot simulate a cell atomistically. Maybe, maybe you can, but not for time scales that are relevant. Um, but at some stage, atomistic simulation is important if you want to capture these effects. Um, at least as part of a multiscalar strategy. So this is what we want to do. And now, unfortunately, uh, that becomes very expensive. So what you see here is um, um, from a Brownian dynamic simulation developed by these two guys, 
and uh, this is a uh, um, 100 by 100 nanometer uh, box of cytosol that you see here. So when you zoom in into an individual protein-protein contact, such as this, sorry for the bad contrast, um, this is a water box uh, which contains two small proteins. In this example, it's bar nase and bar star, relatively small uh, uh, proteins and a very well-studied complex experimentally. Then um, you have a simulation box which contains about 100,000 particles, and that's mostly water. And a few ions and, and uh, a few protein atoms. Now, um, before was better, yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, <coughs> now, as you all know, um, um, doing simulations with such a system is quite costly. So it takes a while to run a significant molecular dynamic simulations. So here is an example of a simulation uh, where the two proteins were started um, some distance away from one another, and bar star diffuses around, approaches bar nase, and then kind of sticks to it, but doesn't really bind, it doesn't find the native complex. And this is a 100 nanosecond simulation. And this has been, uh, for most of the last few <coughs> decades, the um, a, a main problem in our field, the sampling problem, that you cannot easily generate simulations that are long enough so that you can sample reversibly between the, the long-lived, biologically relevant conformations. But um, one thing has <coughs> changed, and that is um, we can easily generate many of these simulations now. So uh, here is a comparison between uh, the Anton supercomputer. This is still version 1. This slide is a little bit outdated, uh, but the general message stays the same. And uh, computations on graphical processing units uh, that like NVIDIA uh, cards, for example, on which you can run uh, molecular dynamics very efficiently using any of these, and uh, by now, several more packages. Um, so now you can generate about 100 nanoseconds per day uh, for a system like the one I showed you um, on one GPU. And uh, you can maybe access many GPUs, either on <coughs> clusters or on publicly available high-performance uh, high computing resources. Um, on a Anton 1, you can generate about 10 microseconds per day. On Anton 2, about 70 or 80. Um, <coughs> but that's essentially one group in the world that can do that. My message is, the sum in, in the sum, if you have 100 GPUs, you have about the same throughput. Uh, so you, you, you also get 10 microseconds per day, and as I said, Anton 2 is faster, but now there are faster GPUs uh, too than when I made the slide, so um, the, the, the speed ups relative to Anton 1 and to relative to these numbers were only driven by newer chips, <coughs> basically, so there is no fundamental difference between uh, the evolution of the two. Um, the advantage is, is, of course, this solution is affordable to many people, and <coughs> this is not. Um, but the disadvantage is, here you get a few or one very long trajectories. Uh, so if your trajectory re really samples between the, slow, uh, uh, the slowly exchanging conformations of your molecules, it's relatively easy to analyze that. Um, whereas this is not the case here. Uh, you have a lot of short simulations, each of them too short uh, to reach equilibrium, to sample uh, the different states of the molecule with the correct probability. So if you would just do histograms of all of these simulations, they would probably all show very different histograms and none of them is correct. So you need to do a lot more work here in order to get the, a good answer. <coughs> so here, here are uh, the problems in a nutshell. We have the sampling problem. We can overcome that to some degree by running many, many simulations in a distributed fashion. Then we have a lot of data that we don't know how to make sense of. So we have an analysis problem. And we need tools for that. 
And finally, we would like to compare in some way to experimental data or to other observables that are of interest. So we would like to extract information from this data that we can compare to uh, measurements, like lab measurements of the system, or gives us insightful information as it extracts the relevant uh, uh, information from the data without having to look at lots of videos. Okay, <coughs> and that leads us to uh, Markov models, which is a group of methods uh, that are trying to do that. Um, and uh, there are many other names uh, for related methods like master equation models or uh, kinetic network models or transition networks, etc. And, and many of them refer to similar concepts. Sometimes you're using um, uh, transition rate matrices, sometimes it's using transition probability matrices. So I think there's a whole tree of different uh, methods. But the rough idea is you have um, a complex high dimensional <coughs> process like molecular dynamics. Usually there's stochastic dynamics and um, you have simulations of that and from data generated by those simulations, um, you try to estimate um, a relatively simple stochastic process, like a Markov chain or a Markov jump process, um, that aims at resembling the statistics in that data. So it's an approximation. Um, but we know a lot about the quality of this approximation and when this approximation is good or bad and how we can test it in practice. So think of this as a numerical approximation method. Uh, like when you are computing um, the value <coughs> of an integral in MATLAB, you're using a numerical method uh, often to do that. Uh, unless if you cannot write down the analytical solution um, for the integrating function, uh, for the integrant function, then um, you will approximate the integral essentially uh, by some uh, uh, sort of histogram. And of course the quality of your result depends on whether your, your bins are fine enough. And if they're fine enough in the right places where the function changes a lot. Right, and then, uh, so when you've understood um, what you need to do to your numerical solution in order for your result to be good, then you can be arbitrarily good. You can make the approximation arbitrarily accurate. Think of Markov state models in the same way. It's an approximation method and we roughly, we, we, we very well know theoretically and we roughly know practically what you need to do in order to make this uh, approximation good and you can test it. Um, so <coughs> that's important to understand in the beginning. Um, many people um, initially said Markov state, well that's not a good idea because if we uh, discretize molecular dynamics then it's not Markovian <laughs> anymore, ergo we cannot estimate Markov state models, it's just wrong. But uh, that's a confusion which comes from the name. Markovianity is not the important thing here. But the name was given before we understood that. So, okay, so in practice, what are the important ingredients and what is required in order to be able to get uh, a Markov state model or a good Markov state model. So the most important ingredient um, in order for this to work practically is metastability. So um, <coughs> here's a very simple example, butane, um, that <coughs> only has one interesting degree of freedom, this torsion angle, and there are three conformations that are long-lived uh, compared to all other processes in the molecule. So you have these three rotamers indicated by the three colors, um, which is, and the transition between them is the slowest process in the molecule, everything else, all the vibrations are fast. So this is what I mean by metastability. There, are so, there is some process, or there are some processes that involve rare event transitions between some metastable sets, between sets of structures. Um, 
And that implies that there is somehow a separation of time scales. There are slow things and there are fast things. And we want to reproduce the slow things and forget about the fast things. So this is something we need to do. We, we cannot get a good Markov model if everything is important. If, if, there are, uh, if there is a very large number of processes, of slow processes, that we want to approximate at the same time, you can essentially forget it. Because that would mean that you would have to ha get a very fine discretization in a very high dimensional space, and nobody can do that in no, in no discipline. So if you have a problem like this, you need to focus on part of uh, of, the, of a part of the problem that is important uh, to you. In our uh, case, usually we're interested in the long time dynamics and in the equilibrium properties. We would like to say <coughs> something about equilibrium probabilities, free energies, transition rates between slow, uh, slowly interconverting sets, folding times, etc. Um, and we can only do that if the number of slow processes is small. Unfortunately, that's the case for many, many protein systems. It's not the case for all possible systems. Right? Protein systems get very, very large. You can imagine that this might not be true anymore because there are too many parts that can move and that can do slow things. Uh, this might also not be true for systems like um, RNAs of significant size because um, they are very frustrated and they have many possible uh, base pairings and base mispairings uh, that um, make their energy landscapes very rough and give them many metastable states. Um, and it might also not be the case for some natively disordered <coughs> proteins, although we don't know that very well because it's very difficult for those proteins to <coughs> make very extensive simulations as that would require very large boxes. So we're just beginning to get there. <coughs> so that's important to know. This is limited. And there are certain things we can do and certain things we can't. OK. Um, what's, the, what's the guiding idea? Um, as I said in the beginning, um, a reason to use Markov state models is if you cannot afford to run a single long trajectory, which is long enough to sample across all the, the uh, uh, the slow events and uh, give you an equilibrium, sample the equilibrium distribution right away. Um, instead, we are trying to break it down. And uh, the idea can be illustrated on, um, um, on, on expectations. Uh, so if you want to compute an expectation of some function of state space, <laughs> Um, then uh, you have to compute a state space integral, and that is hard. So uh, formally, what we would need to do it is the stationary distribution. So we, uh, x is now uh, a molecular configuration. I don't care about velocities at this point because they can be integrated out. <coughs> so um, that's the probability density of a certain molecular structure. And this is the potential energy, and this is the thermal energy, and uh, this is the normalization constant, which is this uh, phase space, uh, configuration space integral in this case. Now I'm interested in computing an <coughs> expectation value. For example, the probability of a protein to be folded under a certain condition, uh, temperature, salt concentration, whatever. Mm, what I need to compute for that is this integral. So the integral over um, the quantity that I'm interested in, that would be, for example, a function that tells me if the protein is folded or not. So if it's folded, it's 1. And if it's not folded, it's 0. So it's something that I can evaluate for each configuration and then assign a value to it. And this is the probability weight of this conformation, the Boltzmann weight. And this is just the expectation value of this. And in a similar way, I can write down expectation values for dynamical quantities. That looks a bit uh, more complicated, but basically it says I have some function A, some function B that I can evaluate. Uh, this should be Y here, B of Y. And I have um, in between dynamics, which takes me from X to Y. 
And in this expression, I can evaluate a correlation function, for example, a time correlation function. So with these two equations, I can practically model every uh, ensemble experiment, every bulb experiment, measure some form of either this or this equation. Um, <coughs> so um, it's important to be able to compute something like this from simulations. So yeah, example probability of building in defaulted state would be just this. We just define the function such that it is one in folded and zero elsewhere, uh, which just means that this integral reduces to the integral over the folded set, uh, and then we just sum up probabilities. And free energy of folding could then be computed uh, using this equation from this result. Okay, what's the problem? The problem is uh, that we need this mu. The mu, again, is the probability weight of each conformation. So if we want to get that from a simulation directly, and first of all, we cannot directly get it on x, but maybe we can, we can get a histogram, we can think of some order parameters, like, for example, uh, the radius of gyration, the distance, the number of native contacts, whatever is a good indicator for <coughs> folding, for being folded or not, and we can sample a histogram on that order parameter from the simulation. And then we use uh, this histogram instead of mu here and evaluate A on our coordinate that we have selected and just compute this by a discrete sum. The problem, we need a converged simulation to get the right mu. You know, we need to have a long simulation, very, very long, in the sense that uh, the protein has folded and unfolded many times in order for this guy to be converged. And there are some uh, D.E. Shaw, Anton simulations available for which this is the case for small proteins and where you can actually do that. But they are like milliseconds long and they're still small proteins. So even using something like Anton, the, the systems for which you can do that are very limited. Um, and um, I, I, I know actually many people working at uh, <coughs> uh, uh, DESRES and there are, there are a lot of people there that are doing method development for enhanced sampling, which tells you even if you have full-time access to an Anton, that doesn't solve your sampling problems. There are still a lot of problems uh, that you cannot solve with that. So sampling is always an issue. Um, <coughs> okay, so how do we avoid this? We need to do a different approach that doesn't require us to have this mu. And the idea here is sort of a divide and conquer approach. So we rewrite uh, that integral in this form. Looks a bit more messy, but basically all that has happened here is we have split <coughs> up this integral into multiple parts. They are called SI. So each SI is a set, is a region, of configuration space, like a cluster of structures, and each of them has a weight pi i. Pi i is the stationary distribution or the equilibrium distribution of that cluster. Yeah, it's the integral of the probability weights of all structures in that cluster. And now we can just sum them up in order to get the integral, and then we integrate only over the parts, and we have to divide the weight of each structure in the parts by pi i, and then it will be equal to the previous expression. And this can be also written as this discrete sum, so this is just the sum over clusters i, weight of cluster i, and the mean, obser the mean uh, observable in cluster i. Now this is a little bit better, because this mean observable is something we can easily sample. So um, if you design your clusters well, so if the clusters are local in the sense that within the cluster you can sample around relatively quickly, then you don't need only short simulations in order to get a good approximation of the mean observable. Um, <coughs> the problem is um, how do we get the weights of the clusters? And the key for that is, um, now we can write down another equation, uh, which is this. 
So P is now a transition matrix that together with the discretization is the Markov model. And pi is an eigenvector to P with eigenvalue one. So that's an eigenvalue equation with eigenvalue one. one. <coughs> so that's the left eigen, so the row vector pi is the left eigenvector of P. Or it's the same to say P is the normal, the right eigenvector of pi is the normal, the right eigenvector of P transposed. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> Okay, P is the transition matrix, so that's this um, equation here. What is that? It just means um, for all simulations that you have, look at which state uh, you have been at a certain time, look at what state you are at a certain time tau later, and um, uh, integrate uh, 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 this transition probability using this weight. And um, we will have um, we will have uh, uh, um, estimators uh, to get this number from simulation data. So in practice what you do is you do a discretization then you map your simulation data onto the discretization so you have discrete trajectories that are essentially jumping around between cluster labels and uh, then you count transitions and from these transition counts you can estimate a maximum likelihood transition probability matrix or um, a Bayesian sample of this transition probability matrix. Okay, so what have we gained except for more complicated expressions? Uh, we have gained that everything on this slide only depends on a local equilibrium. So this, um, uh, these A bars here only require us to average locally within one cluster, which can be done quickly if the cluster is designed well, if it doesn't involve high barriers inside of the cluster. Uh, so we somehow have to split at the barriers for this to make sense. And this quantity here um, only contains this expression, this is a local equilibrium density. So again, it's something that can be uh, sampled well. Um, and this contains transition probabilities sampled by our MD engine. So this is something that we have a machine for. We can start at some x, propagate for some time tau, and get some y. So everything here is local. We don't have to have no, any knowledge of global equilibrium anymore. That's the key. And uh, uh, that's, that's the basic idea behind all of these methods, Markov state models, uh, master equation models, rate models, all of this stuff. <coughs> uh, it's a divide and conquer method that allows you to use short simulations uh, to, um, and, and combine them in a way so as to reweight them to a global equilibrium. Okay. <coughs> So a Markov state model <coughs> is um, a special form of these methods, namely one that uses um, a clustering of state space discretization. So in this simple example of a state space here, this is a two-dimensional example, of course, for visualization. In, in reality, we have higher dimensions, clearly. Um, we just chop up these probability densities into histograms. In practice, of course, we don't use histograms because that wouldn't work very well in high dimensions. Um, but we use some data-based methods, uh, clustering in adequate spaces. And then our Markov state model e evolves the probability on this discretization. So for example, if you start with an initial distribution of structures like this, it's discretized like this, and then you have some model, a transition matrix, which can evolve this distri discrete distribution in time. And um, eventually, uh, this will evolve towards the equilibrium distribution of your system. Now, in molecular dynamics systems usually have a unique equilibrium distribution, the Boltzmann distribution, and you will 
uh, evolve towards that. So this is a kind of an ensemble view. You are saying, I have a distribution of systems with these probabilities, and I can e evolve this distribution in time. This is something you could also do in, a, in an experiment, in a kinetic experiment, like a temperature jump experiment, or other experiment where you start at some condition, and then you let evolve towards a new equilibrium. Uh, you could also see this uh, as a model for a single trajectory, though. You could say, okay, this is a transition probability metric, so it's a rule to jump in time. So I can start at a certain state, then I can draw uh, from the row of this transition matrix, whose state I'm in, the next state I'm jumping to, by simply sampling from that probability distribution, and then I go to that state, which puts me in a new row, and then I sample from that state, etc. So I, I generate a discrete trajectory in time which evolves my system uh, according to the rules <coughs> that I've estimated from the data. And with that I can, of course, generate arbitrarily long trajectories uh, from which I can compute quantities of interest. We will actually do that later um, in an example, but um, pretty much whenever you want to do that, there is also an exact way of doing this computation. Uh, at least I have never seen an example where you have to actually simulate this, this matrix other than if you want to generate a movie. Uh, so whenever you actually want to compute a quantity, an uh, expectation, a rate, whatever, you can directly compute it from the matrix. Okay, um, a little bit of history. Um, so mathematically, I would say, the, the paper which uh, started the idea of using Markov state models for uh, molecular dynamics is this paper by my colleague Christoph Schütte, who is actually the, uh, now the president of the Zuse Institute, which is the building opposite of this. And um, he described uh, uh, the basic idea of uh, using many short simulations and combining them in such a way in order to approximate uh, um, long time molecular dynamics, which he calls conformation dynamics. And then um, <coughs> there were, um, for a long time, there was almost nothing. There were a couple of mathematical uh, contributions, uh, uh, very um, theoretical, um, but almost nothing in terms of actual um, applications. And at some point, computers became fast enough that you could actually do something with this idea. And in the mid-2000s, uh, people like uh, uh, myself, John Codera, uh, uh, Vijay Pande, and a couple of others uh, started uh, to use and further develop these ideas. And here are two early papers that came out back to back in uh, JCP. Um, on uh, constructing Markov state models for peptide simulation. And um, at, this, at this time, <coughs> so you have n now you have to read these papers with a grain of salt, because at this time we really thought the importance, uh, if you want to build a Markov state model, the important thing is that you have to have a few states, a few clusters, let's say, and these have to be designed such that you separate the metastable states. So you have to find the barriers, and you have to separate the system at the barriers, and then have one state for this entire energy minimum or energy basin, because um, then uh, there's a chance that if the system enters the state, it stays there long enough to forget where it came from, to lose its memory. And then we can use Markov, a Markov description for the time evolution. That was the idea. And uh, that's, that's also still a, a reasonable idea, but it's uh, not the best thing you can do. So um <coughs> in order to understand a little bit better uh, what instead can be done, um, 
we had to understand the spectral properties of dyna molecular dynamics. So molecular dynamics and every dynamical process, for that matter, can be described in a language like this. This is, uh, instead of a trajectory language, is an ensemble language. So here we say <coughs> we don't have one system that we're evolving in time. We have an ensemble <coughs> of systems that we are evolving in time. So we have a distribution, a probability distribution of molecules that are evolving in time. And we look at each of them. And um, we have some operator. This is a propagator and there are different types of operators which are, um, which can be equivalent, equivalently transformed into one another. Um, the, the propagator says we take some probability distribution, apply it to this propagator, and that gives us a new probability distribution at a time tau later. Okay? <coughs> this is at this point a purely formal description. Just believe it exists and, and it's, it's fully correct. So if your system is Markovian in full phase space, so if you have uh, molecular dynamic systems where knowing all positions, all momenta, all box coordinates, whatever else variables you need in the simulation, you can write down what the next time step will be. That's a Markovian system. Then this description is valid. And it's not valid only for one time step, for, but also for many time steps. So this tau could be long. Okay. Now, um, <coughs> why, why would this be useful? Well, the useful thing about this is um, that for processes such as molecular dynamics and many other processes too, this operator here, which is some integral involving the probability to go from any point to any other point, that's this. So this is the probability density that our molecular dynamics engine samples. You put in a configuration or a config uh, uh, configuration plus momenta. You propagate for some time and you get another configuration and momenta out. This quantity can be decomposed into parts. And these parts are the equilibrium distribution plus some other functions which perturb the equilibrium distribution and they decay exponentially in time. So these are exponential decay rates. Uh, so these are rates that determine an exponential decay. This is just some um, uh, scaled function. Uh, this is another function. These are eigenfunctions <coughs> of the operator. Okay. Again, why is this useful? This is useful because um, these rates here, some of them are slow, some of them are fast. They're all finite. At this point, the only infinite rate is in the equilibrium distribution. So that means this is a representation that you can truncate. So instead of caring about everything in the dynamics, we can now say we only care about the slow part of the dynamics. So the first few terms in that sum, and we throw away the fast stuff. Okay. How do we do that? Um, well, first of all, what does the slow stuff mean? So um, if we look at the uh, eigenvalues, so the eigenvalues are e to the minus kappa i tau. I've already written them in that form because then you see the relation to a rate or an inverse time scale. Um, the eigenvalues of such a system, this is a four-well system and you have a diffusion in that system, are uh, such that there are four eigenvalues that are relatively large and there are a lot of eigenvalues that are relatively small. And in between there's a gap. And these eigenvalues correspond to time scales. So there are slow time scales and fast time scales. The first eigenvalue is always one that corresponds to the stationary distribution. The others are smaller than one. Those are slow processes, slow transitions in the system. The eigen 
functions, these guys here, they show you what is happening at, at those time scales. So the first um, eigenfunction of the of this operator here, that's this phi one function, but that's this mu function, which is phi one, looks like this. This is just the stationary distribution. The second function uh, eigenfunction looks like this. It's negative here and positive here, or vice versa. You can flip this sign, of course, and that tells you. The slowest process, which corresponds to a time scale, which is somewhere here, it's not equal to infinity, but it's large, uh, is the process of going from AB to CD or back. So the transitioning process across the highest barrier. The next slowest process is the transitioning process between A and B, and then C and D, etc. So this hierarchically decomposes your dynamics. And now, ideally, we would like to have a model which captures all of this ABCD transitions. And the rest is not so important. <coughs> the faster, we are not so interested. And you can already see, if you would pick a time scale tau, that is sort of the time step you're looking at, uh, that is larger than these times here, all of this stuff, then you essentially cut all of this away. Then you are effectively doing this truncation. Because the contribution of the fast processes decays with e to the minus kappa i tau. That means minus tau divided by the time scale of that process. So if the time scale is much smaller than tau, it's just gone in this expansion. OK. Now, what is important for getting a good Markov state model? What's important are these eigenfunctions. Uh, these <coughs> are the things we need to approximate in order to get a good Markov model for the long time scale dynamics. Particularly, we need this form of the eigenfunctions, not this form, which is just these eigenfunctions divided by the stationary distribution. So if we divide this by itself, we get 1. If we divide this by this, we get this, which is essentially a s almost a step function, which switches from the AB set to the CD set, etc. So if our system is very metastable, if we have high barriers, these are almost step functions. They're like constant on the metastable sets, and they switch at the transition state. And if this barrier is not so high, the switching is more smooth. In order to get a good Markov model, we need to approximate this switching behavior. And we do that by, discrete, uh, by a discretization. So we approximate the function by steps, by step functions. So our clustering that we do in Markov state models means we basically uh, define functions which are constant on the clusters and, are, and can switch in between. And with this step functions, we need to approximate the actual eigenfunctions, which we don't know. Mm. But we know which heuristics lead to a good discretization and how we can test that. So if you know that, it's already clear that a function like this, which corresponds to the eigenfunction in such a two-well system, can be well approximated by two states if I put my dividing surface exactly on the transition state. That's long known, that's transition state theory, Eyring and others, um, beginning of the last century. Um, but we can do much better if we use not only one dividing surface but multiple because then you get a better approximation of this function. So you can get a much better Markov model for a two-state process if you use more than two states. Um, and so the next generation of Markov models uh, uh, use that idea. So the idea is we have to separate the metastable state. So we, it's really important to have dividing surfaces here but it's fine to have more dividing surfaces. 
uh, because it's not about Markovianity. It's not about the fact that the individual states need to be long-lived after the discretization. This is not a metastable discretization, right? The dynamics will jump around very quickly between these two states. Uh, but that's not important. What's important is that we uh, separate the long-lived states and that our discretization is fine enough. So the idea was then, <coughs> let's use a discretization which is larger than the number of metastable states we really want. So if we w want to approximate 10 processes, maybe we use 1,000 states. And we use some state-space discretization, some clustering, k-means, let's say, on some arbitrary distance metric in order to do that. Okay. Since then, there have been a lot of developments um, <coughs> improving on that idea. So for example, one further development is to use hidden Markov models, or hidden Markov state models, where we use a discretization, but then we construct a hidden Markov model on that. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, um, just so far, with a hidden Markov model, you can even get a good approximation of the time scales if your discretization is bad, to some degree. Okay. Now the next question is, how do we do this discretization? I mean, it's nice to know theoretically that approximating these eigenfunctions uh, is <coughs> the right thing to do, but we don't have the eigenfunctions. So um, um, what do we do in practice? And um, uh, uh, an important aspect is we cannot get a good discretization of a very high dimensional space. It's somehow important that we focus on relatively few dimensions if we want a fine discretization. But which ones should we focus on? Of course, we don't want this to be the same like like traditional free energy methods where you have to pick your reaction coordinate or your order parameter it has to be the perfect order parameter which is slower than everything else because then you have to already know the answer that you want to, to get to. Um, the idea of Markov state models is just to, to use a lot of order parameters and then somehow learn which of these are important. And so a practically uh, a very useful uh, way uh, is to first filter uh, these, these initial order parameters and do some dimension reduction in them. But how do, should we do the dimension reduction? We want to approximate the slow processes. So we should do the dimension reduction such that the slow processes survive and the fast processes go away. So if we can do some initial, some pre-processing which achieves that and reduces the 20,000 dimensions to let's say 20, then we already <coughs> in a much better situation. Um, okay, so let's see uh, what's on the table. So for example, the simplest idea one could have is to just use PCA. That has nothing to do with time. What PCA does, it is maximizing variance. So it, is, uh, it takes a, a data stream with some input dimension. can be arbitrarily large, let's say 10,000. Um, <coughs> and uh, it's searches a basis, so directions, in which the variance is maximal. And it orders the axis um, in such a way that the first axis points along, st along the maximum variance direction, the second uh, is orthogonal to the first, and will be the second largest variance, etc. And then we can uh, <coughs> pick a few of them, let's say 20 or 10 dimensions, and project the dynamics on them, which just means that we take each 10,000 dimensional vector, uh, compute a scalar product with this 10,000 dimensional principal component axis, and that gives us the first coordinate of our new coordinate set. And we do that for all 10 principal vectors, and then we have a 10 dimensional coordinate set. And this uh, um, dimension reduction has a few nice properties. So first of all, it minimizes the projection error in a, in a variant sense. So the distance between 
um, um, so, so if you take your um, um, PCA projection and you kind of invert it uh, by projecting back to the full space with the uh, transpose of the PCA principal component matrix, then uh, the distance between that reconstructed point and the original point is on average minimal of all possible linear dimension reduction methods. So that's nice. Uh, so it looks like this is a very good idea. Um, and practically it's very easy to do. We take our data, we compute the covariance matrix, uh, um, <coughs> which is a uh, square in the number of dim input dimensions. Then we compute the solutions of this eigenvalue problem, take the first few eigenvalues and eigenvectors, those are the principal components, and then we just project our data onto the principal components, and we're done. <coughs> Unfortunately, that's not guaranteed to do anything about slow processes. So for example, in this pathological example, admittedly, um, we have two uh, distributions that um, are stretched on this axis, and the slow process happens between them. So the, tra the slow transition is from here to here, and then quickly we move in this direction. So in this example, the slowest, uh, uh, the, sorry, the slowest direction is this one. So in order to separate uh, uh, these two distributions such that we could see the slow process, we would need to find the y-axis, whereas PCA would find this axis. So um, if, we plot, if we project on the first principal component, we completely overlap the two slowly separated states, and uh, we would get a very, very bad kinetic model if that's our aim. Now the next idea is to use time dependence in the dimension reduction, because we want to say something about the slow components. Um, <coughs> and the idea is the following. So um, we have developed this variational approach for conformation dynamics. And that is a, um, is a mathematical method which tries to find optimal solutions to, the eigen, to these eigenfunctions that we're interested in. So again, the goal was to approximate the eigenfunctions, but we don't know them. So now let's try to construct an algorithm which directly approximates these eigenfunctions, and then uh, we can get a good discretization of them, because then we have a representation of the eigenfunctions. Okay, <coughs> how do we do that, uh, since, since we don't have them initially? Well, we use some, it's, a simple, it's a simply um, related to uh, quantum chemistry in some way. So we, we construct some basis function, yeah, some Gaussians, some whatever, whatever functions you want in state space, and we compute um, autocorrelation functions. And uh, you can show that if you take an arbitrary function um, uh, and compute the time autocorrelation, then this time autocorrelation is uh, is uh, always a lower bound to the first eigenvalue. Um, of this propagator. Now that's not very useful because the first eigenvalue is always a one, so you need that, so you know that already. But um, the trick is that if you vary this function here, so if you try different functions, then the one which is closest uh, to the real eigenvalue uh, is the one where, which has a maximum autocorrelation function. So if you get something which is very close to one, you have a very good representation of this function. Now this function is constant, so it's also known, so that's not very interesting. But the interesting part is, this also applies to all other, uh, other eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. So if you take a, a bunch of functions and compute their autocorrelations, 
and if they are orthogonal to each other, then you get lower bounds to all eigenvalues. And if you vary them, as you, all you have to do is to maximize these, these estimated eigenvalues, which are just autocorrelation, so you can compute them from data. And then you can variationally find a good approximation to your eigenfunctions. Okay, very theoretical. What does it mean in practice? You take some, <coughs> you take your data. Let's say um, you evaluate your, so let's take some uh, just at atomistic positions from your molecular dynamics trajectories. And you can apply some basis set to them. Basis set just means you use some other functions to transform them. For example, you could compute distances between atoms, or you can compute uh, angles for, for torsions or something else. So you apply this to your data, you have another data set. So this data stream of these evaluated functions over time. Now you compute two matrices, the covariance matrix, the same as in PCA, and the time lag covariance matrix. And uh, <coughs> now you solve this eigenvalue problem, which is a generalized eigenvalue problem. You can think of uh, conceptually, not practically, you can think of taking the inverse of this matrix here, Z0. Then what's written here is Z0 inverse Z tau, and then it's a normal eigenvalue problem with that matrix product on the left. So that is in principle what the variational approach computes. Then again you compute these eigenvectors and these eigenvectors are something like principal components but in contrast to principal components those are the directions which maximize the autocorrelations. So those are the slow directions in your set of basis functions. And if your basis functions are just, let's say, distances and angles or something like this, then that means this is the combination, the collective variables that combine distances and angles in such a way that uh, they indicate the slow directions, of what is the, the, rare, the rare event transitions. So they are supposed to separate best you are slowly converting states, your metastable states. And this <coughs> is um, called Tika if, you, if your basis sets are linear. So in other words, when usually when we just take the direct uh, atomic coordinates or maybe some simple transformation of them like um, distances and use that as an input, then this is called Tika. And Tika, uh, we call it Tika because the same algorithm, but without this relation to molecular dynamics, has been proposed uh, long ago in 1994 in the signal processing community. In uh, a, a method that's called blind source separation. So the idea is um, these guys use that for, uh, for audio signals. So the idea is if you have like a party with people chatting and you have a lot of uh, uh, um, um, voices uh, uh, that are being mixed in the signal, then how do you construct an algorithm which unmixes them, which, which gets the audio signals that are coming from individual people? Or you have a, a, a music piece uh, from an orchestra, which is a superposition of many instruments how do you best separate the individual instruments into separate channels? Um, so these ideas are very useful there. Okay, <coughs> so um, Tika is the name under which you find this in Payama. And as Tika input, you can use pretty much any uh, observable order parameter that you want, like distances between atoms, um, dihedrals, etc. But you could also insert um, other nonlinear functions. You can define your own functions if you want. Um, and in principle, uh, if you're using something nonlinear, then this is really the variational approach. But that's just nomenclature. <coughs> 
Okay. Um, I think there will be a, a TCA talk, so I will not go into more detail. It's just as a, a rough example, here is <coughs> an input signal, 10-dimensional, that I've generated. And there is some, there is some metastability in this input. <coughs> you just don't see it. Um, <coughs> so there are some slow processes in here, but they look like noise. So if we use PCA on the data, we get this. So we get noise ordered by magnitude. Uh, that's a transformation, but it's not very useful. And if we use the variational approach, <coughs> we get this. So we get seven coordinates that are noise, and three that indicate metastable switching. This is exactly what we want. And um, the fact that this works so nicely, it has to work by construction. So what I actually did this, I generated this time series. So three interesting coordinates with some uh, um, Markov chains that do a slow transition between uh, different distributions. And then seven times noise. Seven times just drawing from a Gaussian. And then took a 10 by 10 random matrix, matrix with random entries and multiplied it with this data stream, and that scrambles the data such that you cannot see the structure anymore. And that is kind of the problem that we have. We have the scrambled data, we have uh, molecular dynamics, which is very high dimensional and very confusing, and we have um, a data, it, we can compute uh, uh, statistics of uh, angles and distances and atom positions and whatever, but we really don't know what are the interesting directions to combinations of these coordinates in which which really indicate some slow event, some interesting event, because they can be very complicated. So we want to unscramble that data and find what are the collective motions that best describe our slow transitions. There is another trick which is called kinetic maps or commute maps, uh, which basically scales this transformed uh, data stream in such a way that all of the fast stuff is scaled down, is made smaller. That's a way to avoid deciding how many of these dimensions do we need. Because the, the way the scaling is done here is that in principle you can take everything and everything gets the right weight. But in practice it also tells you where you would like to truncate if you want to preserve a certain percentage of the slowness of your system. Okay, I'm not going to go into more detail with Tika because we have a separate talk about this. Just to finish up, once we have that, that that's maybe one of the hardest parts, to get a good low dimensional representation of your system. Once you have that, and that's relatively easy to do with tools like PyHammer, you can al already do a lot. Even if you don't build a Markov model, if you, even if you want to do, uh, let's say, a free energy surface, a potential of mean force, something like this, this is the right space to do this in because it separates the slowly, um, uh, this, the, the, this, this slow degrees of freedom. It separates the things between which you have few transitions. And these are the things you should separate if you do free energy uh, computations as well. And it may also indicate which are states that have not been properly connected with each other. So for example, if you have started a molecular dynamic simulation from different states, different crystal structures maybe, and they have not connected, they have not, one uh, a simulation has not found the basin of uh, the other structure and vice versa, then they will be separated in this plot. So. It that's actually, unfortunately, a common thing that happens when people start using these methods. They first find all of the problems in their data, like all of the, the places where too, the sampling is too little. Um, but it's a good thing in the end because then you can start dealing with it. You can, then you have a, a coordinate which tells you, okay, this is the coordinate along which the slow stuff is happening. So you can maybe select new confirmations um, uh, that are close to each other even though not connected in this coordinate, and start new simulations. 
or you can start new simulations in, in, in the states that have very little population, etc. Um, <coughs> then we do a discretization of this coordinate, usually using some k-means. Once you have found the slow coordinates and you have picked their number, then the exact details of the discretization are not so important anymore. Typically, k-means with a few hundred clusters or so work fine. You can try other discretization methods as well. Um, and you will try some of them, uh, but you'll see that uh, once you have a good space to work in, uh, uh, most of them are uh, uh, giving similar results. Then you estimate the transition matrix between the clusters. So you take your trajectories, you map all of these trajectories onto your cluster indexes. That gives you <coughs> uh, discrete trajectories and from these discrete trajectories you compute some statistics um, and uh, from these statistics you can estimate a transition matrix. Um, maximum <coughs> likelihood transition matrix or um, a distribution of transition matrices if you're interested in errors and uncertainties. Again, more of that later. And once you have that, then you have your Markov model. So the Markov model is the transition matrix plus your discretization. That's the Markov model. And then you can analyze it. You can compute stationary probabilities. You can compute probabilities from any state to go to some, uh, some somewhere else. For example, to fold in a protein rather than unfold. Then you can compute pathways <coughs> from unfolded to folded states or unbound to bound states or whatever. Um, you can compute what are the long-lived states, so which clusters need to be grouped together to define the long-lived states. Experimental observables. All of that tomorrow <coughs> in detail. Okay. So, I'm almost done. Um, if you want to read more about this, uh, there's a review book here. It's very expensive, actually, but there are a few. Uh, it's basically a, just a reproduction of a few uh, papers that are available. So maybe we can just put the papers in the Dropbox folder um, or give you the links. Um, Payama is developed on GitHub. Uh, Martin will tell you more about that. This is the citation for Payama. Uh, it appeared in JCTC 2015. And <coughs> this is where you find the docs, Payama.org. Um, probably many of you know uh, GitHub. That's uh, um, the service for, for, for public code development. Um, and um, basically, if you're interested in development, you can watch the repository. This means you will get a lot of emails of all of the stuff that happens on the repository, like all of the issues that are posted. So if anybody has a problem or so, or if somebody uh, from our group decides we want to develop something and throws out an idea and this idea is being discussed, you have some uh, um, ways to set how much you really want to get in terms of emails, not to be overloaded. So this is if you're really interested in getting involved. Uh, you can start a repository that's basically like a, a like, a Facebook like uh, um, of the project. And this is important, issues, you can report issues, anybody can report issues. Uh, so if something doesn't work, if something crashes and you think it's a problem of Payama and not of uh, your code using Payama, uh, then please report it here. Uh, we are grateful for that because uh, it helps us to improve the code. This is uh, our research group and you will see many of these people uh, during the week in the various <coughs> talks and tutorials. <coughs> So far, thanks for your attention.